We've been discussing the, um, the oh, yeah. row about Kemi uh, Badenoch and her claim that she has been misrepresented. And we thought we should start by playing what she actually said about maternity pay. And then we can ask you, um, is she right to say that she was misrepresented when she gave the impression that maternity pay should be scaled back? Well, <laughs> she just said it. We just heard her say it. She used the word excessive. They didn't, nobody put that word in her mouth. Yeah. I was also struck when she talked about how women used to have babies according to the season. Uh, I, I mean, what? Look, She's saying that a woman should only have a child in the uh, spring so she could work in the fields in the summer or something. I, I mean, it's a very strange intervention, and it's lots of people are talking about it here, saying it's Kemi Badenoch's first big gaffe of the Tory mm. conference. There are two criticisms of uh, uh, Badenoch from her opponents. One is her temperament, that she could start a, a row in an empty room. Uh, she doesn't own her gaffes. She claims she never makes them. Uh, she's on record of saying, I never make gaffes, but she does. So that, there's a temperament issue. The other one is she's very ideological and she's against regulation by the state. Now, that's fine. So she's against excessive fine. regulation. Yeah, excessive, like, like maternity well, pay. Like women, like women getting excessive. paid. Now, the problem with that is you say, let's get rid of unnecessary excessive regulations. Well, what are unnecessary excessive regulations? They're normally your, your job rights. They're normally your rights at work. We saw with Grenfell, the government has, let's have a bonfire of regulations, and it ended in an inferno in a block of flats in which 72 people died. If she thinks ex maternity pay is excessive, explain it. Look, six weeks at 90%, and then, what is it, £185 for 33 exactly. weeks or so? We've got amongst the worst maternity in pay in any developed economy. No, we have. There's no <laughs> it's doubt. not excessive. There's I... no doubt. But it's also very, it's very curious for a, a woman contender for the Tory leadership to potentially be alienating an awful lot of women voters. Yeah. Well, I, I think it would be interesting for the viewers to know that according to Lord Ashcroft's biography of Kemi Badenoch, she didn't take maternity leave from the Spectator magazine when she had her second child. She's a mum of three. When she had her second child, she left the company altogether so that she didn't cause any inconvenience. Um, and the editor of uh, The Spectator, I think, had uh, praised her for that. Having discovered she was pregnant, she told me she thought it would be unfair to ask us to keep her job open while she was on maternity leave, so she resigned to have her baby, says Fraser Nelson. She would have been within her rights not to have done that, but as an employer, I really appreciated it. We're a small company. Then he closes out that quote by saying, I'd say a sense of decency is perhaps her biggest defining characteristic, along with a weakness for street fighting. Which, I suppose, sort of reflects what you just said, Kevin. Yeah, employers claim statutory payments back from the, you know, from the government. Uh, you know, so it's not their it's not their cost, but if she can afford, she's in the lucky position. Yeah, there's right. enough money in that household for her to go off like that. Then good luck to her if that is her choice. But do not threaten to do that to other women or put other women under pressure. Uh, look, I mean it's uh, it's you know, it's just wrong, isn't it? There are going to be women watching now who are either on maternity leave or about to go on maternity leave, and I'll think, oh. Can you imagine if my employer, just like the leader of the Conservative Party, didn't uh, take maternity pay? Why are you? Just go. Give up your job. Off you go. Look, we're supposed to be a civilised society, not one where women are under pressure, if they have a child, to, uh, you know, to give up work or lose their job. I thought, I thought those centuries were way behind us. Andrew, what is the sense and the mood there at the Conservative Party conference? Because, of course, <laughs> currently they are leaderless. Um, is Kemi Badenoch, who was once the front runner, still someone who actually speaks for a lot of people but just publicly says things which are uncomfortable? Or is Robert Jenrick uh, now going to become the party leader? Or is James Cleverly, who perhaps is more familiar to viewers likely to be the leader? Or what about Tom Tugan and his cans of Tom Tugan tan, which I hope you've got there with you? Can you excite viewers? I'm wearing it. Are you? <laughs> you are. I knew it. I'm wearing it. I knew no, it. No, no, yeah, no, I, don't, I don't need it. No, listen, I've got an outdoor no, lifestyle. Trust, trust me, <laughs> I wouldn't wear it. 
Trust me, it's um, Tugan Tan, your conference glow up. I've got to say, ten, <laughs> ten out of ten for Tugan Tan because his his tat, as I call it, is the best tat. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good tat, but actually, so you're um, saying you prefer a, a big, different there's brand? There's quite a lot Andrew. of people talking. About are you saying you prefer a different <laughs> brand? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I just don't know where this comes from, actually. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of talk about Tom Tugnat here. He's a former distinguished soldier, military man. There's a lot of talk here. But the most striking thing, I went into the conference hotel here, which is the Hyatt, at about 9.15, 9.30. I could get a drink at the bar. Now, normally, oh. at first night, a party conference, it's eight deep, and you just think, forget it. Uh, I only stayed for one, but um, so it's just, it's pretty quiet. Rishi Sunak has been and gone in the blink of an eye. He arrived on Saturday, he'd gone by Sunday, It's all, because it's all over for him, uh, and very little regret about that, I would say. But I think there is a, a bit of excitement around uh, Jenrick and a bit of excitement around Tom doing that. I'm not even sure Kemi Badenoch's going to get in the last two. She carries on like this, she may... Because uh, what there's four, there's four candidates, and after that, they're all going to perform on Wednesday, they're going to do the stuff one after another, and then the, the MPs will vote, and on Monday they'll be reduced to three or two. Mm, yeah, okay. we've got Liz Truss's speech to oh, uh, look yes. forward, just, just to remind the country why it booted out the Conservative Party. I'm sure they'd quite like her to stay away. Uh, look, I, I thought be careful. Kevin, Kevin could do with some of yeah. this. Right. He, he needs to brighten up a bit. Look, I've got a fly spray here. <laughs> look, I'm going to get rid of this pest. Well, but, Kevin, I'm going to um, uh, Labour... change yeah. the mood for you slightly because, of course, even though it's the Tory party conference, there is still so much controversy about what the Labour government is doing. And we have uh, mm. Rosie Duffield who, it has to be said, was never one of Keir Starmer's biggest fans. But she was a Labour MP until a couple of days ago. She's now resigned from the party, although she remains an MP and will do, presumably, until the next election. But the reason that she's resigned is because she's very upset about withdrawing the winter fuel allowance at the same time as taking thousands in freebies. And she compounds that criticism by saying that the Prime Minister has a woman problem. Now, does he? Is that a more widely held view? And what happens to Rosie Duffield now that she's stopped being a member of the Labour Party but carries on being an MP? Yeah, her, her letter of resignation was one, one of the most blistering I've read and she went out with all guns. I'm not sure about the women problem, although he used to take a different position on the trans question, which is, is very dear to her heart, although he's actually moved to where she is now, or much closer to where she is. But clearly, she's been on a political journey. She wasn't really regarded as on the left in the past, but she's picked up this issue of winter fuel compared to the freebies, which many people have. Look, we've criticised it. We think it's a, it's, a, it's a terrible look. It's a terrible reality. Now, that question of uh, what does she do now, she can stay an MP. She can stay an MP for nearly five years, get a £91,000 a year. I actually think the system is wrong. If you change parties or you're kicked out of your party, I think a by-election should be triggered because most MPs are elected because they stand for the party. And so, well, the month before last, she was elected as a, uh, as a Labour MP. She's decided to change it. She can just sit there and carry on drawing her salary. I think... Uh, other MPs have done it. There were Tory defectors to Labour in the last election. They didn't have by-elections. I thought that was wrong. I've, I've consistently thought it is wrong. If you are elected under a party label, you decide you don't want to be in that party anymore, you should ask the voters, in this case, Canterbury and, and uh, Kent, whether they want you as an independent rather than the Labour MP they elected you as. But do you know what the most significant thing for me here... It is never before has an MP abandoned their own side so soon mm. after a general election. We've not even had 100 days of Keir Starmer as Prime Minister and a Labour MP is so fed up... Well, it with looks the, cynical. Well, no, sorry, Kevin, it's so cynical. fed up with what he's Come been on. doing as Prime Minister. Mm. He, t taking all these freebies, at the same time, right. he's stealing hundreds of pounds from some of our poorest pensions over winter fuel. It is unprecedented for an MP to abandon ship so quickly. It's the, it's the quickest she, in modern she, history. She's had a very difficult relationship with a local yeah, party right, though, in I? Canterbury, I'm a right. national, probably, Kevin, right. probably for once, you are. I am right. the quickest, although if you, go back, if you go back in history, there might be somebody I else. Said in modern but, history. But I think, I think you're probably right. But she's had a difficult local uh, relationship with her party in Canterbury. She's had a difficult uh, relationship with a national party. 
difficult relationship with Keir Starmer. So this is probably oh, is she, is coming she a difficult woman? some time. In is fact, she a difficult were, woman? No, but there were there were people in a local party wanted to deselect a dumper as a candidate, and they were stopped nationally. I, I know that, you know. And the from, issue, the from issue, conversations the issue, both locally and nationally. When she says he's got an issue with all the men, she, you remember she was appalled when Keir Starmer couldn't define, when yeah. Keir Starmer got into all those difficulties when asked, can only a woman have a cervix? And he said, mm. well, that's not a straightforward question. Mm. Yes, it is. But, it, but the, Yes, it is. Uh, and she was appalled S by it. Susanna. And she's also a great advocate of women-only spaces and she doesn't feel she's got that support no. from the Prime Minister. Susanna, the people who could answer better whether, whether Keir Starmer has a problem with uh, women are probably the chance Chancellor Rachel Reeves, the Transport Secretary Lou Haig, the Home Secretary Yvette Cooper, the Welsh Secretary Joe Stevens. It'll be what it'll, it'll be one of them, not me. J.K. Yeah, Rowling would agree with exactly what she said. Can I take you back though to the um, to the winter allowance? Because I think one of the things, um, if you were Keir Starmer, Rachel Reeves last week, the week before, you thought you'd answer these questions very clearly. Not going to be U-turn. Want to move on. One of the differences between government and opposition, in, in, in opposition, people uh, tend to forget what you said last week. In government, it stays with you. Is there any sign, yeah. do you think, of the heat, the pressure going out of this uh, issue? Because with energy prices rising tonight, and this, um, um, yeah. uh, and another report about pensioners worrying about um, being warmer this winter, it feels as though the political energy is not dissipating at all. No, it's not, because, as you say, energy bills are about to go up, winter is coming, costs will rise, people will have to make a decision whether they put on a coat or turn on the heating, uh, whether they eat, whether they heat. It's, no, it's going to dog and cast a long shadow, and deservedly so, over this government all through the winter and possibly be beyond that. There's many good things I, I believe they've started to do on employment rights, on housing, on rail... But this is a huge error. And there's, there's no sign yet of a U-turn. I never rule these things out, because in a two-and-a-half trillion economy, the 1.3, 1.4 billion, they reckon that, uh, they'll save from taking away up to 300 quid from 10 million pensioners, is loose change down the back of the sofa. It's, mm -hmm. Governments have often in the past have said, oh, we didn't want to do this. No, we don't have to do it. Hallelujah. Uh, let the church bells ring and you know, all celebrate. We can, we can not do what we were forced to do when we looked at the books and we saw the spending was so terrible and a dismal inheritance from the Conservatives, but we miraculously found some money. Now, if capital gains tax is going to go up, and I think it deservedly should go up in the, in the budget, if inheritance tax loopholes are going to be closed, if taxes are going to be raised in other ways on those who are, are wealthy and the highest earners, surely they can find the money to reinstate the winter well, fuel. Well, Andrew, we yeah, are inundated. Well, Andrew, yeah. we're inundated yeah. again. Sure. Uh, as we are every morning, there's something mm. hugely psychological, not just practical, but psychological, mm. about losing this winter yeah. fuel allowance. People are not thinking, OK, I, you know, I'll do... I'll spend less elsewhere in order to put the heating on. People are getting in touch. They are literally not going to put the heating on at all. As Kevin says, you know, they're going to mm. choose... <laughs> other things to do. My father is 86, says Tracy. He has cancer. He worries about the bills all the time. He sits in a heated electric blanket. That can't be right. He's frightened to turn the heating on. He's presumably made the calculation that, of course, you know, just having the electric blanket is cheaper than trying to heat the house. Karen says, I used to have heating on a timer. I don't even put it on in the morning. No longer take baths. Always have a shower. We have blankets on our sofa to wrap up. It's as if no one cares about the elderly, although the government have their heating allowance and food allowances. Dave says there'll be no heating in my home. Already I've had the gas meter taken away as it saves over £100 in standing charge and I'm never, ever voting Labour again. It's a massive psychological, practical blow and it could lead, as we've seen this morning, to more elderly in hospitals this winter. Well, and we shouldn't forget that research published by the Labour Party back in 2017 when Theresa May was running for, to, in the 2017 election, mm -hmm. which suggested a, a, a further 4,000 pensions would die if the winter fuel allowance was scrapped. Well, what's changed? Because that's still going to be the same today. So how can a Labour Prime Minister possibly go ahead with this when he was signed up to this research only in 2017? 
It's astonishing. It's, Nothing's changed, but, just, but but a lot more. Oh, there's probably a lot. There's a lot of more older people now than there was in 2017. Yeah. So that figure could be even higher. Susanna, when it was introduced by Gordon Brown, when the Labour Chancellor, he said it was his most significant in, change. 1997. He used to always list it as one of his, did. his first or one of his first uh, achievements. Of course, he could have put the money just on the on the weekly pension. He could have done that, but, but he, he didn't for two reasons. One is you actually get a bigger political hit if you say it's a winter fuel allowance, but also means down the line you get a bit bigger political hit when you take it away. But he knew the psychological impact because it is saying here is a chunk of money hmm. for you to spend on your exactly. hitty. So there will be many people who can't afford to turn on the heating, but there will be others who could, but because, as you say, they're losing their allowance, they psychologically think... They can't afford to turn on that heat. Yeah. And that will result, as you say, in people in the attic, in, in, in hospital, but it will also, sadly, result in deaths. How terrible is that, that a Labour government's doing this? I know, and... and, and that's the one thing that people are talking about okay. here as well. It's the, to the Tories have got more of a spring in their step than you'd have thought because they can't believe such a serious misstep being so, so early so Neil, on Neil into has a, emailed a, a, a us Labour government. Who, says, who puts it exactly like that. I'm very sick myself. I'm scared of the energy prices going up because we know, of course, energy prices go up from midnight tonight. Uh, I voted Labour to protect vulnerable people, says Neil. Yet it's always the yeah. disabled and pensioners that get blamed. I voted Labour for over 30 years. I will never again vote. I don't trust any party. Rosie Duffield could not have put it any better, says Neil. And just to remind viewers, in her resignation letter, Rosie Duffield says, um, someone with far above average wealth, that's the Prime Minister, choosing to keep the Conservatives' two-child limit to benefit payments whilst inexplicably accepting expensive personal gifts of designer suits and glasses costing more than most of these people can grasp, entirely undeserving of holding the title of a Labour Prime Minister, forcing a vote on the winter fuel payment to make many people iller and colder. Mm. Uh, Kevin, how long will this last? Oh, uh, so throughout history, unless it's reversed. Mm. Look, when people, when people look back at this, uh, at this Labour government and how it started, it, it, look, it started well. There was a lot of goodwill. Uh, generally, Starmer is considered to have handled the riots uh, decently. And, but this is the, the long cloud. Now, you, 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 write, you write a Labour, Labour government and, and it will be... Two things will, will be remembered. One is the freebies route and the other is yeah. the winter fuel and, allowance. And, and, I mean, and, and we now know... Not good for him. We now know from the weekend press, the Guardian broke the story, that actually he got £32,000 worth of freebie clothes, high-end clothes, from Lord Alley. £32,000 worth. I mean, how many suits is that? That would buy about 400 suits for you, Maguire. I think it'd get more than that, I mean, I'd tell you. He only £250 for his suits. £32,000 in, in, this, in less than a year. This I mean, one. for God's <laughs> sake, why does any bloke need £32,000 worth of suits and glasses? I mean, honestly. Well, well it's a mistake, isn't it? He's been, da he's it's been dazzled. He's been greed. dazzled by the offer of mm. free clothes, and he should not. He's just, whoa, 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 no, um, no, 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 no. Uh, he needs to have a decent than, suit, but he can than, buy a decent that's suit. That's more than most people own in a year. Yeah, mm. Matty on X... Um, just staggering. Matty on X turns his attention to the merchandise. MPs selling merchandise at Tory party conference while Brits are having to ration energy. How about they give the proceeds of the merchandise to those who need it, like the elderly yeah. and others who can't afford can to heat their say, homes? Can I they're giving it away because who would buy this tat? Oh. Nobody would buy it. Okay, They're giving it away. Mm. Um, right, yeah. let's just... It's my first freebie of the Tory conference. <laughs> yeah, you're a freebie king, I can't believe that. Um, <laughs> just finally... But it did not cost Kevin... £32,000. Kevin and Andrew, in the Daily Mail, your paper this morning, says that non-payment of the BBC licence fee could stop being a crime. And it is over fears that women are being unfairly penalised. This is a, apparently yeah. the Culture Secretary, Lisa Nandy, and the Justice Secretary, Shabana Mahmood, understood to agree that failing to pay the £169 annual charge should be decriminalised. Now, this, I think, was something that Liz Truss uh, brought up at some stage. Do you think that's likely to happen? 
I hope so. I think, I think it's wrong to criminalise it. It'll still be a debt. You'll still be chased if you don't buy a TV licence and you're required, but you won't be in court. Doesn't mean you might still have the bailiffs round, which I'd uh, be uncomfortable with. But, look, it's, it's been talked about for a long, long time. And as, as, the, as the TV licence is looked at and how we fund the, the BBC, I think decriminalising uh, non-payment should just be a first step. And some people have ended up in prison over this, which is absolutely ridiculous. The prisons are filled with far too many people who shouldn't be in there. Yeah. And non-payment of the TV licence, they go to prison for not paying the fine. That's right, and the fine goes up and up. Now, that might still happen, or you end up, you end up with a bailiff. So there's no, there's no easy answer. Mm. But well, we it is you better this, um, not to have people in the dock. We don't ask you this uh, every day uh, this week. Um, just feeling the mood down there. On the basis of yesterday, at the moment, who's going to win this leadership election? Um, I've got to try and get excited and interested in this question. Uh, <laughs> probably. <laughs> I mean, it was so bizarre. I walked straight in here yesterday morning and bumped straight into two of the leadership contenders. Normally, it's so round, you probably wouldn't see them for hours. I bumped into Jenrick and I bumped into Tugendhat. I still think it'll be Tom... I still think it'll be Robert Jenrick who quit Rishi Sunak's government over the fact that they weren't getting a grip of immigration. He's the hardest line on immigration out of the four contenders, and yeah. I think that is the big issue for many Tory Tories who, are, who will choose their next leader. Robert uh, Generic, Robert Generic, he'll be anything you you want. Uh, the, tr the truth is, they might they might vote for him, but Labour won't fear him. Uh, Tugendhat is a bit of an unknown quantity because he wasn't a, a cabinet minister or the attended cabinet, but he wasn't a full cabinet minister. Uh, the truth about um, Badenoch um, or Bad enough as she is now. Uh, is she, she can get attention, but the yes. problem is she can sometimes blow herself up. She's a street fighter, yeah. as her former boss described her. Right, thank you both very much indeed.